the unexpected, this life. Waiting can grow weary and steps grow tired. Find that you can stand brave in fear. Rise above the noise and the chaos. Because from above, the view looks different. You can see farther and ascend higher. Run and not grow weary. Stand tall and yet learn to lean in closer. See a glimpse of heaven above the wreckage and a beautiful sound above the madness. Find a hope renewed and a strength returned. Learn to soar.
God, it's our prayer that you would be lifted high in every area of our lives, that we wouldn't segment you, wouldn't put you into a box, wouldn't just serve you on the weekends or when we stream into a service, but Lord, that you would be a part of our every day. When we breathe in and when we breathe out, every move, every word, every thought, that it would be of you and for you and with you, Jesus. That we wouldn't just sing a song because it's a song, but Lord, that we would live a lifestyle of worship in everything that we do, in everything that we do, that you would be praised, Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Can we give him a shout of praise? He's so good, isn't he? Hey, I'm Pastor Carl. I am one of the executive pastors here, and we're so glad that you're streaming in with us. In fact, if this is one of your first times here, maybe you just haven't taken time to do this yet, we'd love to have you click on our Start Here button. We'd like to get to know you and, and get connected with you because we realize we're on opposite ends of a screen and, and camera, but we want to get connected because we believe the church is made to be connected. And so if you would take a minute to just fill that out and we'd love to get to know you. Also, I'm going to start over. That was way too long. Okay. I was going to say that was pretty good, but... Okay. I mean, we, you can use it, but... <clears throat> yeah, go ahead, Dick. Okay. Do another take. Hey, I'm Pastor Carl, one of the executive pastors here, and I'm just so glad that you're joining us online. In fact, if you're new with us, or maybe you've been streaming for a while and you haven't done this either, we'd love to have you take just a few minutes to fill out our Start Here card online. We'd love to get connected with you because we realize we're on two sides of a screen and a camera, and at the same time, we realize that the church is made to be connected, made to be God's community. And so we'd love to get to know you and know how we can encourage you as well. And with that being said, some of the ways that you can stay connected as a church community is by downloading our 2911 Church app. And you can download that on iPhone or Android or whatever type of phone you use, unless it's a flip phone. We can't help you there, but jump online with us. But download our 2911 Church app. You can watch. Uh, messages and, and uh, from past series and past weekends here. You can find out about what's going on on site and, and online through our 2911 Church app. And uh, something else I wanted to just point out is uh, just recently we launched our Alpha Community Group. And uh, we have people that filled my house, but also we have people logging on online, somebody from Washington State that logged on as, as well. And what is Alpha? Is it's a group of people that are either seeking out what it is to have a relationship with Jesus and discovering if, if that's for them or not. Some of the people in Alpha are, are new believers. They started to follow Jesus and they just want to know what it really means to follow him. And, and, and still others are coming that, that have known Jesus for years but want to have a deeper relationship. They want to understand what this Christian faith is all about. And I love what God is doing in that group, that amidst that room, both online and in person, we got to see and, and hear just vulnerable hearts uh, sharing stories and sharing where they're at as a community. And most of all, people seeking Jesus, seeking to understand who he is. And what does that mean to me and for us as a church is this, is in Romans 8, 15, it says that this life we've been given, this faith we've been given is not a timid, grave tending faith, but it's adventurously expected. Greeting God with a, with a what's next type of attitude and, and, and spirit. And I love that about our church is that there are people discovering Jesus in a whole new way every day through 2911. And that's something I want to stand behind. That's something I want to support. And the way that God is, has designed his church is that it's supported both through you and through me. Not just some big vendor and some big giver out there, but through you and me, God's made a way to provide. And, and that's through something called the tithe, is that we give the first 10% of our income back to the local church. And so we want to encourage you to pause right now to jump on our website or our app and, and take some time to give. And, and practice this thing called tithing because God has invited us to, to provide for his church. But more importantly, here's the cool thing, is God's given us the tithe to help us learn to trust him with our finances. And so I'm going to pray right now and just encourage you to, uh, to take that step 
Maybe you've never tried tithing before and, and 1% is all you can even muster the courage to do. That's okay. Like start somewhere and let's trust God with it. Will you pray with me? God, thank you so much for this community. Thank you for the new stories you're writing in Alpha and across this community, both, uh, both out of state and in state, both in person and online. God, I pray that you would use what we give to continue to build your kingdom, to continue to do new things, God, to bring new life and adventurously expected faith into people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, looking forward to tonight. What? It's going to be hot, hot, hot. What? Who is this? Quit playing me. Have you broken up with her yet? I'm really confused. Haha, <laughs> stop playing, Mike. I think you have the wrong Mike. Isn't this Mike Davis? No, this is Mike Davidson, your new boss. I just hired you. What? Uh, sorry, not meant for you. Wrong, Mike. Well, that was awkward. All right, well, that was awkward, right? Are you guys ready for some awkwardness? Yeah. We are gonna open up with it and start right away. Are you ready, church? Yeah. Are you ready, online church? I know you are. And we're gonna be moving to Genesis 38 with a very moving story about Judah and Tamar, all right? And so tonight and this weekend and this morning, whenever you're watching this, we are gonna be talking this, this weekend about, <laughs> I can't say it, anyways. Um, Starting in verse 38, about this time, Judah left home and moved to Adullam, where he stayed with a man named Harah. Then he saw a Canaanite woman, the daughter of Shua, and he married her. They say, oh. When he slept with her, it's already starting. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son and named the boy Ur. Everybody say Ur. That's a rough name, I'm just going to say. Then she became pregnant again and gave birth to another son and named him Onan. And when she gave birth to a third son, she named him Shelah, and the name, and at that time of Shelah's birth, they were living in Kazib. And in the course of time, Judah arranged for her firstborn son, Ur, to marry a young woman named Tamar. Everybody say Tamar. She's central figure of the story, verse seven. But Ur was a wicked man in the Lord's sight, so the Lord took his life. Wow. Then Judah said to Ur's brother Onan, go and marry Tamar, as our law requires the brother of a man who has died, you must produce an heir for your brother. Okay, and in verse nine, but Onan was not willing to have a child who would not be his own heir. So whenever he had intercourse with his brother's wife, he spilled the semen. <laughs> on the ground. Thank you, thank you, okay. <laughs> this prevented her from having a child who would belong to his brother, but the Lord considered it evil for Onan to deny a child to his dead brother, so the Lord took Onan's life to, would you pray with me? <laughs> Lord, I'm sure this has been the setup in some churches somewhere. <laughs> it's awkward to talk about all this stuff. And so I just pray. I felt such a sense in worship in the building and online um, that your roof is open and this roof is open and you want to move in the lives of wherever we're at because there is a lot of confusion about sex and sexuality in our nation and around this world. And we know that your word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so we're gonna choose to trust you this weekend. We're gonna choose to listen this weekend. We're gonna pray against shame. We're gonna pray against guilt. We're gonna pray against the things that have caused so many people to lose so much hope in you and in their life. And so we just pray for freedom in this place. Lord, we love you. And everybody said, and everybody said, amen. 
Come on, Jesus is good. Thank you, Andy. Welcome to the talk. Everybody say talk. I mean, a few weeks ago, I was sharing that we need to have a talk, and we talked about the talk of spiritual maturity, but we are finally there. We have grow we're growing up, and this is the other talk, because uh, we're going to, you know, talk about the birds and the bees. Are you ready? All right? Um, I mean, wow, what an opening scripture, am I right? I mean, some of you might be thinking, like, is that in the Bible? And I'm telling you, it is in the Bible, Genesis 38, because the Bible knows all about the chaos and the beauty of sex. Come on. Um, and that's why I wanted to open with it. I had thought about this, and I'm like, what would be the best way to open uh, a, a night and a weekend about sex? Just say it, right? Just read about it. And nothing like the story of Judah and Tamar. So I want everybody to break the ice. I want you to take a deep breath wherever you're at, whatever your age. Come on, take a deep breath, all right? Look at the person next to you and go, it's okay. It's okay, all right? It's going to be okay, all right? Because this weekend, we're going to be looking at a, at a subject and how we see it, not through our eyes, but through the eyes of our Heavenly Father, right? And I'm so excited about it. But first, I want to go through a little bit of the rest of the story we opened with. And don't worry, everybody, this talk this weekend is PG rated, all right? Uh, so Judah and Tamar, we, this whole situation sets up, and we know that Judah kind of did a, a dirty deal on Tamar. He was supposed to help provide um, a husband for her, because in that day and time, if you didn't provide a husband, if, if a husband had died, then, I mean, it was curtains for you probably as a woman in that culture. And, you know, it, 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 your verse continues on in, in 12. Some years later, Judah's wife died, and at that time of mourning was over. Judah and his friend Hurrah, the Ad Admulite, went up to Timnah to supervise the shearing of his sheep. Because what had happened is there had been years of separation. He hadn't finished the oath that he had committed to Tamar, and here is where he goes. And it says in verse 15 that Judah noticed something, and he noticed this prostitute. Um, that had a covered face, all right? So he stops and he propositions this prostitute that's standing there, and he says, I mean, it's right here in Scripture, let me have sex with you, not realizing that she was his own daughter-in-law, all right? This is getting messy. Thank you, yes. And um, I'll send you, she says, how much will you pay to have sex with me, Tamar asked. I'll send you a young goat from my flock. That was the payment, okay? Okay. Um, <laughs> Um, but what will you give me to guarantee that you'll send the goat, she asked in verse 18. What kind of um, guarantee do you want, he replies. And then she says this, leave me your identification seal, like your driver's license, its cord, and then a walking stick you're carrying. Again, she's th thinking ahead, and Judah gave them to her because he was desperate. <laughs> And then he had intercourse with her, and she became pregnant. And afterwards, she went back home, took off her veil, and put on her widow's clothing as usual, because that's what she was, was a widow. In verse 20, um, we see that, you know, this whole thing keeps unfolding. And they find out that the this, that this situation is getting uglier, because then Tamar, it's announced that she's pregnant. Everybody go, <gasps> okay, it's announced that she's pregnant. And, um, and so they drag her out, and they're going to basically stone her. They're going to stone this prostitute for being pregnant, because that's just what they did in that day. Um, and then it says in verse uh, 24, about three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has acted like a prostitute, and now she's pregnant. And so he says, bring her out and let her be buried. Now, this is Judah demanding this, right? In verse 25, but as they were taking her out to kill her, she sent this message to her father-in-law, right? That he doesn't know that that's Tamar. The man who owns the, these things made me pregnant. Look closely. I love that. Look closely. Because what you're going to find is your seal, your driver's license, a cord, and a walking stick. Joke is on you, buddy. Judah recognizes them immediately and said, she is more righteous than I am because I did not arrange for her to marry my son, Sheila. Shella and Judah never slept with Tamar again, thank God. Um, but I love this story because it is very scrupulous. Everybody say scrupulous. It's steamy. It's sexy. And it's in the word of God. And it shows the reality of the world we live in. If you don't think that God is up to speed with what's going on, then you're missing the point because he was up to speed from the beginning with Judah and Tamar, and he will be to the end, all right? He understands it. And I find it fascinating that the one place that we should be talking about the issues of life, hence the Awkward series, um, we easily avoid. 
Because most churches, they ain't talking about the talk in their teaching series. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Christians avoid it. They avoid the subject of sex, um, and they hope that people just figure it out on their own. I mean, I think it's still very taboo and awkward to talk about it in the Western church. Don't bring it up. So we let other people do it for us. Celebrities, they're going to talk about it, and we're going to listen. Music, right? I mean, you hear it all over the radio, right? Film, Netflix, books, social media is talking about it, right? Hookup sites, Facebook, porn. I mean, it's displaying what their definition of sex is and where is the church? Come on, I know what's out there and so do you. I mean, we're living in a sexualized culture to say the least and the church cannot put its head in the sand and hope it will just go away. And that's what this weekend is for, because we got to face it head on and have this awkward conversation. Because what does God say about this amazing gift that he created from his perspective? And that's what we're going to look at, because sex affects us all. Our view of sex, whether you're single, married, widowed, divorced, been married, 35 plus years, engaged, you're in junior high or you're in high school, whether you are more of a conservative when it comes to the subject or you're more of an open book, sex and the sexualization of the world we live in has to be discussed. And today's culture is different from the past in many ways. I mean, it's, it's not the sex and the allure of it um, that, that we're missing. It's just that sex through the ages just hasn't been as public as we see it now. I mean, let's look at the medium of television. How many of you have a television in your house, right? A big flat screen, right? Uh, saw them on sale. Walmart today is 75 inch for 800 bucks. I mean, the bigger TV, I know what, the better. So we're giving away a 75 inch TV right now. <laughs> Just kidding. Anyways, um, because when television first came on the scene, it was very tiny. It was in black and white. In the 1950s, sex was non-existent on TV. Married couples like Lucy and Ricky, right? Um, on I Love Lucy slept in twin beds. <laughs> and they never talked about anything. They couldn't even use the word pregnant on the air. During the 1960s, married couples like Herman and Lily Munster from the Munsters, right? Um, they were allowed to share a bed. But all they were allowed to do in the bed was talk, all right? Because that was the only thing happening in America at the time. Um, and then there was I Dream of Jeannie. Barbara Eden couldn't bear her midriff. Um, she could bear her midriff, but she couldn't expose her belly button. Go figure, okay? And then things started changing in the 70s, right? 1972, the title character in the hit series Maud could, on, could not only say the word pregnant, but then as a midlife woman, got pregnant on the show. Uh, um, series like Charlie's Angels, right? The Love Boat, The Love Boat. Fantasy Island, boss, boss. Three's Company. I mean, this created a whole, whole new genre of television that they called Jiggle TV. Enough said. <laughs> The 1980s brought provocative primetime soap operas like Dallas, Dynasty, Falcon Crest, and Knott's Landing. Uh, I mean, these were like, you know, sex suddenly now was going from the bedroom into our living rooms because they were talking about it and literally having it. And by the 1990s, cable television had blown through it all. HBO, Showtime, and MTV had changed the standards of acceptability forever. I mean, and it had reduced expectations. There was the first teen orgy in 2004 and without a trace. The first threesome. You're like, oh, Pastor Mark's going there. All right. And Gossip Girl, 2009. I mean, there was sometimes partial and not so partial nudity. In the 1990s, they showed the first male butt on the television. All right. And then there was shows like FX's Nip Tuck, Rescue Me, and Stars, Spartacus, Blood and Sand, featuring scenes that we can't even talk about comfortably in this message, okay? <laughs> and now we find ourselves in the 21st century here. It's 2021, and most of our programming is from streaming networks who have no industry standard at all. And as long as it's acting, just about anything can be viewed on the stream. In March of 2019, 2,200 random people were part of a survey regarding sex and TV streaming shows. And the survey was done by a company called Statista, and they were asking this question. And this was just open. It was social, economic. I mean, that wasn't, it was, it was diverse. Race was diverse. I mean, around the country was diverse. And they asked this question, how bothered are you by sex on TV streaming shows? 
Now, you would have thought the stats would have been, you know, maybe a little more even, but it was interesting that um, as of March 2019, the majority of those that responded said they were not bothered by seeing sex on TV at all because they see it everywhere. Only 24% said the inclusion of sex on television bothered them a lot. That's it, 24% times have changed. Another study, um, starting with the most basic level of analysis, addressed the question, how frequently are sexual themes and topics found throughout the television landscape? Maybe you've asked yourself that question. Is, is this happening on any other channels? Well, um, out of 959 general audience programs that they took a look at, more than two of every three shows, 70% contained some sexual content in the form of talk about sex or actually seeing sexual behavior. I mean, we're so used to it that we are absolutely blind to it, right? And what does all this mean? What are you like, Pastor Mark, why on earth would you spend an entire week in talking about sex? Because we're in the thick of it, my friends. And if you got children in this room or grandchildren, they're going to experience new levels of sex and sexuality than generations before. And it's not that it hasn't been there. It's just that we're a little more willing to take the risk in this generation to share it, right? And the state of individuals, remember this, going to church and declaring God is the focus point of their lives is declining. But the other stats for sex and sexuality are climbing. And this is no surprise to God. I mean, Paul wrote about it in 2 Timothy 2, 1 to 5. Talk about relevant. This is what was written a few thousand years ago, right? But I realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come, right? For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, um, uh, revelers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of, of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, and they avoid, and then he says, avoid men such as this, Right? I mean, it's no surprise, and so that's why I wanted to talk about it in our Awkward series, because this is the truth, my friends. I want to bring redemption back to a topic that has been stripped of what it was created for, and we got to have a talk. And I promise there's no charts or diagrams. I'm going to leave that up to Jerry and Debbie Gray, our premarital counselors, all right? You got questions afterwards, talk to them, all right? I mean, this is about understanding not the act. This is about understanding the gift and how God created some, something so beautiful and how it's so tarnished, so dragged through culture's mud. Can it be made whole again? And that's the question that we're asking. Can it be relevant to what God created it for? It's about gaining God's perspective so we can hold up the light of purity in a world of darkness. So we got to talk about it and we got to know where we stand. Because I don't know about you, but do you remember when you first heard about S-E-X? Think about it. Jog back in your mind, because I know where I was. I mean, I wasn't really, you know, it, it didn't happen from my parents. Thank God, no. Um, it didn't happen at my church youth group. It didn't happen in my church. It was at the lunch table in sixth grade. Dwayne Smith dropped the mic while we were eating our peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and drinking our Capri Suns. As I bit into the apple that my dad had packed into my lunch, my innocence was suddenly tainted. He described in detail what he had heard about sex and then how he had participated in it that weekend. I about dropped my Capri Sun. I was in shock, people. And that left me with the question, what was I going to do about it? And so thank God for DC Talk, people. Because what happened is DC Talk wrote a song called I Don't Want It, all right? Yeah. They wrote a song. And I got some people that are going to help me sing it. I got my background singer, Sonia. Give her a shout out. I got my dancer, Zach. And I got... 
the best rapper on this planet, KFC, Carl Feller. And I want you to get on your feet, people, because I'm bringing you back to 1989. Uh, and I want to teach you something that helped me learn what it meant to have some barriers when it came to being hot and sexy. Because I was. But I learned that I wasn't. Hit it. Let's go for it. Are you ready? If this is a sermon and a song. You got it? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. 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 Oh, yeah. Mm, 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 mm. I'm telling you. Oh, there we go. Here we go. Come on. Come on, get your hands together. You can't be a boring audience. Come on, Sam. Woo. Oh, yeah. You guys got it. I need a little swaying. I need a little jumping out there. Who's ready to bring it down? Let's go. Here we go. I don't want it. I don't want it, want it, I don't want it, want your sex for now. Oh yeah, I don't want it, I don't want it, want it, I don't want it till we take the Here we go. Girl, it's gonna take a little time for us to see. Oh yeah, that love is simply more than just to fulfill a need. Come on, Carl, call. For S-E-X. We must. We need to find the cure for the disease. Call us. us. And trust us. In God above to shape our lives in harmony. Oh, yeah. That's why I'm saying, yeah. I don't want it. I don't want it, want it. I don't want it, want your sex for now. is on the TV, too much skin is in your fish. You gotta make the right decision. God's gotta set his standards high. I'm ready, this is I. I'm gonna choose to wait, wait, wait. Are you ready? I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want it. Want your sex? Go, Carl! SEX is a test when I'm pressed, so back a ball with less of that zest. Impress this brother with a life of virtue. Innocence is since it's gonna hurt you. Safe is the way they say to play. Then again, safe ain't safe at all today. Just wait for the mate that's straight from God. Don't have sex till so you, you tie the, the knot. knot. I don't want it. I don't want it. Want it. I don't want it. Want your sex for now. I don't want it. I don't want it. Want it. I don't want it. Want it. Come on, one more time. Here we go. Marky Mark and the bunch. Oh, yeah! Woo! You may be seated. Thank you, Nicole. Give Nicole a shout out. Here's this fanny pack. Okay. Wow. I can't breathe, number one. I know, I say it every week, and some of you are like, this church is weird, all right? Aaron's got his family visiting, and he's like, oh my gosh, Pastor Mark. <laughs> Don't do it. But I did it. Yeah. Because sometimes when the subject gets a little awkward, you got to break the ice, people, all right? And God created sex anyways, so why are we holding back afraid of his message, right? Because it's a relevant issue. I mean, the prevailing attitude in our culture is it's just sex. And in a recent survey of people of all socioeconomic backgrounds, races, living in North America, 29% of people said they had sex on their first date, okay? Men have had an average of 20 sexual partners in a lifetime, but women average six. 11 million adults said they visit adult-only websites in a typical week. It's a lot of people. 65% of teenagers said they've had sex by the time they finish high school. 
And four in 10 babies in the U.S. are born out of wedlock, okay? So here's what you got to hear. This is not the shame zone this weekend, all right? And if you identify with any of those stats, here's the problem with the church. We tend to point our finger at everybody when we should be looking back at us, right? Because the question isn't, hey, what did you do? The question is, how can God redeem you now, right? How can God redeem the gift that he made, right? And that's what we're looking at, and that's what our conversation. And so I'm going to give a disclaimer. Everybody say disclaimer. Disclaimer. Before I go any farther, you got to know, this is a really challenging subject to teach, okay? Um, We're living in a culture where teaching truth and correction are not always welcomed. And I'll be honest, man, some of you probably already tuned me out, except for the rap. You're like, this guy is weird, all right? Because most of us are probably saying, hey, you can't tell me how to live. And millennials and Gen Zers, I mean, you guys live in a world of unlimited potential, and you possess so much internal information to create a better world. But you and me, we don't like to be told what to do. Don't tell me what to watch, who to vote for, and how fast I should or shouldn't drive, right? And sex, S-E-X, even more, po- even more polarizing. Don't tell me who to sleep with or not, if I should swipe or not, and if sex is even on the table for discussion. It's my body, it's my choice, and I get it, you guys. I get it, my friends. It's your choice, and that's why this message is so important. And I was walking with Asia. We were walking our dogs this week to Starbucks, and I said, how do we reach your generation with the message of purity? Nobody wants to hear it. How does God reach your generation? And her comments kind of left me sort of numb. She said, I don't know, because nobody wants to be told what or what not to do. And so that's what this weekend's for. I'm not here to spar or pick a fight or pick up a sword with you. I just want to have a conversation, okay? Because the bottom line is this. I want to see God's blessing in your life rather than constantly having to deal with the ugly side of what sex can do to your mind, your body, and your soul. Because there is blessing. There is blessing. And we see this blessing. And we look in the Old Testament, and and we actually can find it. And and it's written um, in the Old Testament book of Genesis. If you fully obey the Lord your God and carefully follow all his commands, I give you today, the Lord God will set you high above all the nations on earth. All these blessings will come on you and accompany you if you obey the Lord. You'll be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. Who wants to be blessed in this place, right? The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land, and the young of your livestock, the calves of your, her- the, the calves of your herds, and the lambs of your flocks. And some of you are like, I don't got any of that. I might have some chickens, but I don't got any of the other stuff. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out, and it continues on. And this, that's the blessing of God when we obey him, my friends. And some of you are like, Pastor Mark, that is Old Testament. That's OT. I want NT. And it's in the NT. Because how much more did Jesus raise the bar for us? He came to fulfill the blessings in your life. And when you obey his commands, I mean, the blessings get even greater. And there are blessings that come when we obey God. And this is what Jesus said in John 14, 21. God will be revealed in us when we, when we follow his commands. Those who accept my commands and obey them are the ones who love me. And because they love me, my father will love them. And I will love them and reveal myself to each of them. Another thing, that another blessing is God will dwell in us. God will dwell in you if you're willing to obey him, right? With your heart, soul, and mind. John 14, 23, Jesus replied, anyone who loves me will obey my teaching. My father will love them and we will come to them and make our home with them. Maybe some of you can't figure out why you don't feel God, and maybe it's because there are some issues in your life that you haven't worked out between you and God. Maybe there's some obedience level there, right? God will abide in us and we will experience real, everybody say joy. Who doesn't want to feel down deep a sense of peace and comfort and laughter and love? And John 15, 10 says, if you keep my commands, again, you're seeing this in every blessing, keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy, everybody say joy again, may be in you and that your joy may be complete. You want complete joy? Then obey God, right? We also know that that. Another blessing is we will know that we know and love God. First John 2, 3, we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. And I love this one. We will be friends of Christ in John 15, 14. You are my friends if you do what I command. Who wants some of those blessings? 
I want some of those blessings. But here's the, here's the action point is we got to serve him and we got to obey him. He's not saying being perfect, right? Because he died for our failures, but he's like, serve me, surrender to me. So let's take a look at a few questions that might help us understand how to live in God's blessing. Everybody say one. one. What was sex created for anyways, right? Maybe you're wondering that. Maybe you're watching or you're here and you're like, what's the big deal? And I love this because sex was God's idea. If you didn't know that, he created it, all right? I mean, a sexual relationship in marriage teaches us something about the nature of real love, God's love. And in Genesis 1.27, it says, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. There's that word again. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. I mean, the act of creating man in his own image as male and female, God created human sexuality, right? It is his design. It is his gift to us. Our sexuality is connected to the fact that we are the same species but different in gender. So he created the parts, my friends. <laughs> you didn't. He did. It's okay. And then he put us as individual stewards over the parts. Let me say that again. He made you a steward of your body. And you're a steward of your mind. So what you do with your mind and body is up to you. He put you in charge of it. I mean, the parts. We all know what the parts are, right? And sometimes we're like, well, it's the parts that own me. It ain't the parts that own you. It's you and your heart that owns you. Genesis 2, 21 to 24. So the people are like, okay, Pastor Mark is going. All right. Genesis 2, 21. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, he took one of his ribs and closed up uh, and the place with flesh and the rib that the Lord God has taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Let's give a shout out for the girls in the house, all right? The man said, this is a, um, at last a bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she's been taken out of the man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and his mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. That word flesh. So when a husband and a wife become one flesh, they experience a deep physical, emotional, and even spiritual oneness that binds them together. But it does more than that. It also points and reflects the goodness of God because God created this awesome thing, right? It's weird. I know. I don't get it, but it's awesome. And all the married people are like, yeah. And I was talking to Daryl earlier. He's like, yeah. And all the single people are like, I hate messages on sex because, yeah, you know what I'm saying? That's the beauty of this because what God created, he created for us, but it's passionate like a flame, right? And if you can imagine the greatest fire in front of you, um, and, and, and I mean, it's just a, a really passionate, beautiful fire. And here's the problem, is that if it doesn't have a parameter around it, it's obviously going to spread and it's going to grow. And we've been taught in the church that sex is dirty, and we start to take that flame, and if we don't have any parameters on how God created it, it gets out of control fast. And before you know it, everything around you is burning down. And the passion of sex was created to be pure, but it's got to have boundaries which God laid out for us. Let's go back to the opening story. For Judah and Tamar, it burned fast, burning down the house. It burned down their house, and it burned down that family. And what happens to a lot of us is we get the, de the desire, right, and the passion for sex, which is what God created, but we don't have any parameters. And then we destroy the purpose. And I want you to hear this. It's super important. Sex without God's parameters destroys its purpose. And that's why we see the chaos today in all of our lives, including myself. Because its biblical purpose was to fill the earth, right, in Genesis 1, and to fulfill the marriage through the intimate act with pleasure by becoming one flesh. So when you release passions outside of marriage, intended for marriage, you're building a fire, and a very big one. And there isn't a person in this room that doesn't understand the burn sex can leave in our souls when the flames have gotten so out of control that they leave us with addictions, physical diseases. It can tear down a marriage. It can tear apart a marriage. It can crush a family. It can destroy a relationship and singe our souls with a lifetime of regret that we can't seem to forget. This is sex. So why is sex so powerful? Somebody say why. 
I don't know. No. Um, <laughs> sex is so powerful because God is an extravagant giver. And this is what I want you to know. He doesn't create subpar gifts. Think about it. God just didn't create us like animals, right? We're not just like animals all around us, just for procreation and that's it. God gave us something to enjoy because it involves your body, your spirit, and your soul. And the Bible talks about this. Because in 1 Corinthians 6, it talks about sexual sin and the burn that we just mentioned, right? And there's some definition in this. And Paul talks to the Corinthian church because they had a culture like ours, very sexualized, sex gods. Women prostitutes were gods and walking around and trying to convince men that, that, if, that if they had uh, sex together, that they could be more powerful. And this is what Paul writes. You say, I'm allowed to do anything because we hear that in our world, right? I can do it. I don't care. But not everything is good for you. And even though I'm allowed to do anything, I must not become a slave to anything. You say food was made for the stomach and stomach for the food. But you, but you can't say that our bodies were made for sexual immorality. They were made for the Lord. And the Lord cares about our bodies. And God will raise us from the dead by his power just as he raised our Lord from the dead. Don't you realize that your bodies are actually parts of Christ? Should a man take his body, which is part of Christ, and join it to a prostitute? We saw that with Judah. Never. And don't you realize that if a man joins himself to a prostitute, he becomes one body with her. And from the scriptures, the two are united into one. But the person who is joined to the Lord is one with him in spirit. Run from sexual sin. Paul is like, run. No other sin so clearly affects the body as this one. I want you to hear that again because this is out of God's word, which is the truth. And if you're a Christian in the house or online and you believe so wholeheartedly in Christ, I want you to hear that line again. No other sin. I'm not, I want you to think about the other sins in this world or the things that affects us. No other sin affects the body as this one. For sexual immorality is a sin against your own body. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit which lives in you and was given to you by God? You do not belong to yourself for God bought you with a price. There's the redemption. So you must honor God with your body. So when we participate in sex outside of how God created it to be for human beings, this is what he created, then we sin against ourselves. And that's why it's so devastating to deal with sexual issues. And a lot of you know that. We know that. It's tough. And our bodies are tied together with another body. And that, that's called a soul tie, my friends. It's the one act that we do as humans that doesn't involve one person. But as Genesis says, the two become one flesh. And that's why sex is so powerful. That is why God said to wait and why becoming intimate before it's time can create that soul tie that leaves you putting anything else before anything else in your life. And this is what Jesus does. Jesus comes on the scene and he challenges us even more. This is what I love about, about Christ. He doesn't just go poo-poo to the Old Testament law. He like raises the bar. Am I right? He comes along and says what? In Matthew 5, 28, he defines what lust is because lust isn't just with the eyes. He understands that it's not just a physical act because it comes out of your heart. He says, have you heard the commandment that says you must not commit adultery? Because they're trying to catch him again um, in, in his talk and what he's teaching and saying. But I say anyone who even looks at a woman with lust has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Which is why when you see it and you allow it to move, um, it, 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 it's a sin against your body. So if your eye, even your eye, your good eye, and I got two bad eyes, causes you to just to lust, gouge it out and throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your hand, even your stronger hand, causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. Is it better for you to lose one part of your body than for the whole body, body to be thrown into hell? And we're not talking about trying to, you know, hurt and maim your body. What he's trying to make a point is say this, deal with it, because it'll deal with you. And this is why we can't put our heads in the sand, church, because it's rampant, even in the church. I mean, we got porn. We're sending nudes. We're talking and taking that extra glance, right, even with people in our own church, stalking people's bodies on Instagram, hooking up on websites, doing everything else but the act of sex. And here's what I want you to see. It's that flame that gets out of control. It gets out of control. And then the house burns down, and we're left with the ashes. But this is the cool thing about God. He can take ashes and make something beautiful. But you got to be willing. But you got to be willing. So we've got to get back to the beauty of the gift. We've got to get back to the beauty of the gift. And I have just four really quick things that I want you to hear 
about why a sexual relationship is so beautiful and why it's gifted for marriage. And the first thing is this. Sex is meant to strengthen the marriage bond. We've, we figured that out, right? I mean, the ongoing participation in sex is the instrument God uses to build a couple together. You may still experience physical pleasure if you have sex outside of marriage, but there'll always be an emptiness in your soul, and you know that. Come on, people, we know that. There is something missing, and that shallowness to our sexuality is what we experience apart from a lifelong covenant. The second thing is God wants to teach us more about the relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because there's a oneness there, right? There's three persons, but they're one. And this is what marriage is. It's two persons, but they become one flesh. It's so powerful. And God's just trying to say, hey, it matters. This relationship is sacred. It matters. So we have to treat it that way. And in, in the Old Testament, right, when Adam and Eve sinned, I mean, what, what, what were they before they sinned? Well, they were naked and unafraid, right? That sounds like a TV show. <laughs> And this is what God is doing. He's trying to desire a relationship with you. And what happened when they sinned? They became naked and afraid, right? They realized it. And so God wants you to know that this relationship in marriage is just an echo of what your relationship with him should be, intimate and strong. The third thing is God also wants to give us a picture of Christ's relationship with the church. In some mysterious way, the husband and wife relationship and our sexuality is tied to that picture. In Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, this is what was Paul writes. He writes, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. God loves his church. It's written in this translation. And he wants to give you a picture of the church and how much he loves his bride and he doesn't want anything to hurt her. Just like you out there who have a, who've had a bride or you've got a bride right now or you want to be a bride, you want to marry somebody that, that isn't going to hurt you. So why do we hurt ourselves and why do we hurt others? God so protects us. So shouldn't we do the same in our relationship with him? And the last thing is a sexual relationship in marriage teaches us something about the nature of real love and that's God's love. This is super important. Over a lifetime in marriage, we learn that in order for our sexuality to be expressed in the way that God intends it, the sexuality needs to be unselfish. Both husband and wife must be committed to pleasing each other and meeting each other's needs. Sex that happens outside of this action, i.e. one night stands, is selfish sex, and it's not God intended. So how do we bring back the beauty in a culture that's just stripped this thing? We focus on the one who created it first. Because it's all about intimacy. That's what I want you to hear. We're all searching for intimacy. We're searching for it and searching for it. I was at Alpha this last Wednesday and I shared this illustration in John 5. This story of a woman who was searching for it. And I love that the New Testament and the Old Testament don't hold back. Come on, five husbands in. Those weren't perfect, Pollyanna, beautiful relationships. They were sexual, and who knows what was going on. But five husbands later, she's living with a guy. She's intimate with a guy, and she's sitting with the Son of God. She's sitting with God who created her. God isn't afraid of your pain, and God isn't afraid of what you've done. And he'll sit with you at that well if you'll listen. And so she listens, and he says, Listen, listen, girl, you've been dipping into wells outside of the living well. You're trying to make that work and that work and that guy work and that relationship work and sex work and maybe not sex work or whatever. But if you'll dip into my well first, I'll bring everything into order. And that's what you need to hear. She was trying to quench her thirst for love in one relationship after another, one emotional intimacy, one sexual intimacy, but couldn't find it because that's not what she was created for. And some of us are trying hard to make it work. We think the physical act of skin on skin will bring relief to our souls. And you know what it does outside of God's desire? It just complicates it. There ain't no judgment in this place. And you need to know that. I'm just asking you the question, has your life been complicated by confused 
sex. Because Jesus teaches us something here. When we are close in proximity to God, like hungering and thirsting after real intimacy with God, it seems to help all the issues fall into place. Because if you'll put him first, he'll help you realize what the order is next. The problem is we're not putting him first. We do a little bit. We come here, God, God, Monday night, Tuesday night, Friday night. We're swiping. We're trying to meet somebody. We're trying to figure it out. And we're missing the point. That God is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he's created something to be the definition of identity and love, and that's our relationship with him. Because sex is just a gift we get to experience in this life. It's not life. It's not our salvation. It can't pay for our eternity. But we live searching for these wells with desperation as if it could. And Brenda was sharing her heart with me today. We were talking about this. We've had this conversation all week, and she made this point. She said, if you had to live without sex, you could. Because intimacy and the intimacy we crave isn't found rolling in the sheets. It's what fills our hearts when we have intimacy with Christ. And I'll close with this. I loved our premarital counselor. He was a former alcoholic, a converted sinner, now a pastor. And 35, nearly 35 years ago, we sat in his office at North Central Bible College because we were getting married. (laughs) And I was excited, right? Brenda was excited. Like some of you are, and some of you have been, or some of you want to be. And Brother Crew, that's what we affectionately called him, he didn't hold back any punches because he had already been punched enough. None. And he suffered his own setbacks and was determined to help others by overcoming and showing him how to do the same. And so he says to us, so you guys want to get married, huh? Do you love each other? And we're like, (laughs) yeah. I love her. Friend is like, oh, I love him. He says, cool. Let me ask you a few questions. I'm looking over at her and she's looking at me like, dang, this is easy premarital. So Mark, what if Brenda puts on 200 pounds in the next 10 years? Are you still going to love her? I'm like, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. He says, so Brenda, what if Mark in 20 years of marriage in that 21st year has an affair? You still going to love him? She's like, yeah, I think so. So Mark, he says, what if Brenda can't bear children physically? Are you still going to love her? Now it's starting to get serious. He looks at us with tears in his eyes and he says, so you have a a child with a disability. So much that it costs you more time and care than you could ever give to each other and anything that you had ever planned for. You still going to love each other? I said, "I, I want to. And he said, Because what if you lose a child, Mark and Brenda? Did you know that 80% of marriages where a child passes end in divorce? Now I wanted to get swallowed into my chair. And he says one final thought to us on that Friday night in our first premarital counseling session that set us up for where we are today. Not a perfect marriage, but when it gets tough, we know we got to figure it out. He says, here's one you may have not thought of. What if one of you experiences a car accident on your journey of life and you're not able to enjoy the pleasures of sex anymore? Would you have enough love to stay together? Because true intimacy, it doesn't just come from the bedroom, my friends. It starts in your love for God. And if you'll love God with your whole heart, you will be able to endure anything that comes your way. So this is what I'm saying. I know we got a room full of individuals and maybe you're listening online and you got all kinds of things that you've experienced, you've been through. Some of you sexual trauma. Some of you, you gave your virginity up so young and you feel so bad about it. And some of you are trying to figure it out. I'm telling you, there's no shame in this room. What I'm saying is we got to figure it out because God wants you to live a healthy, whole life, my friends. And this is where it starts. It starts with being nakedly honest with a father who already knows and saying, God, I want to be intimate with you, more intimate with you than anything. And God isn't 
your sexual intimacy. That's not what we're saying. What I'm saying is put him first and sexual intimacy will find its place. It will be beautiful again and it will remind you of what it was created for. But it's got to start with him. And so we're going to close by offering a song to you. No, it's not I don't want it. <laughs> but it's a song that I learned. Thank you so much, Nicole. Back at a time in my life when I was trying to figure out what intimacy was. A man by the name of Owen Heaslip in Scotland wrote a song when I was a newer believer. And I used to just sing it because I was aching for intimacy. I'm an adopted kid with a hole in my heart because we're all made with a hole in our heart and I was trying to fill it with intimacy. And nothing was filling it. No fantasy, no porn site, no nothing will fill the intimacy that God can bring. No relationship, no sexual relationship outside of the confines of what God has given you in marriage can fulfill what he can. And I want you just to think about the intimacy of your life and the intimacy you have with God. And as we close, I believe God wants to heal, to give hope, and to help us find the beauty of it again. Some of you, you need to make some changes. After this message, you got to make some changes. You got to figure out what you're doing in the relationship you're in. God isn't mad at you. We're not mad at you. You just got to figure it out because it will affect you. Some of you got to set up some borders and parameters because that fire is hot, hot, hot. I'm serious. And you'll get burned over and over again if you don't decide what you're going to do with it. Some of you got marriage issues you got to work through. You got to let go of. You got to forgive and you've got to be forgiven because God wants a healthy whole church. He wants a healthy whole kingdom. He wants men and women to experience what he created from the garden. And that's something beautiful. So what do you need to change to adjust, to remind yourself of? Because he wants to be intimate enough to say, I'm here. I can take the ashes. I can take what has been burned and make something beautiful. So just think, and then we'll pray. It goes like this. With all of my heart, a hunger for you. out our hands and let's take a moment to allow the Holy Spirit to move to allow him to heal to give us hope and to at least start the process and the journey it doesn't happen overnight and it may happen over a period of time it may take a while but God wants to renew this beautiful gift he has created for us what are you gonna do with it I'll sing together Oh, with all of my heart, a hunger for you, 
longing for, Lord, is your intimacy, your intimacy. So I pray that we could find it. And so in this place right now, you're helping marriages find boundaries so they can remain pure and intact. You're helping singles, widows, divorced, saying, okay, I'm going to set up for myself some parameters so that fire doesn't get out of control. And if it means I got to remain in this state my entire life, it's worth the obedience before the Lord. It's worth his blessing. You got to set up those that maybe have relationships that God helped them to reset where they've been, where they've come from, and remind them that your grace and your mercy heal and restore them. It's intimacy with you. And I believe, God, what we're going to see in, in the coming weeks and coming months and coming years is these ashes, things that once burned, now beautiful in your name. And everybody said, amen. Wow, what an amazing, rich message. I want to encourage you, let's just continue to respond to what God would be speaking to each one of us. Uh, in fact, maybe you've been watching and, and you feel God tugging at your heart. You've never made that decision to follow Jesus. Well, I want to encourage you to, to make that decision today. It's, it's this simple. Is it, it, it's simply saying, Jesus, would you come into my heart? I trust you to be Lord and Savior of my life, and I want to follow you with the rest of my life. And so, so would you pray that with me? And uh, let's pray. God, thank you so much, all that you are, for your love and for your grace. God, for every person that is making that decision to follow Jesus right now, we just pray this simple prayer. Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I choose to follow you today. Will you be Lord and Savior of my life? In Jesus' name, amen. And church, thank you for joining us. We love you. Let's stay connected throughout the week through social media and our 2911 church app.